My name is Aaron White. Uh, my wife and I um, are the Youth for Christ uh, staff in Collingwood. Uh, we've been here, it will be 17 years this coming June that we have um, been working with teenagers in, uh, in our community in different, um, different ways and different capacities. And we love it because every day is different. Every, um, every story that we hear from different teenagers just energizes us to get to know them more and to walk with them on this journey of um, getting to know God more. And so um, for some of you that have walked with Danielle and I in prayer and uh, in, in financing as a, as a church, um, we, we just want to thank you for, um, for journeying with us as, um, as we invest in the lives of young people. Well, this morning, uh, I want to just share something as I, I, I was doing some really um, fun reading and research over the summer and um, just about some cultural things about the Middle East that I didn't know about. And so as I was, as I was reading uh, my Bible and reading this, this, uh, this book, um, I thought, oh, this is, re this is really fascinating. I want to start developing um, some messages on this and, and share this. So a few years ago, I took up running. Uh, I wasn't always a runner. It hurt my body. I was not in good shape, but I would aspire to run and, and enjoy it. But every time I decided to go for a jog, I would get a few hundred meters away from my house before I would reconsider my life decision to start, try and run. <laughs> I took, running took time and patience in order to build up stamina. And after I had gotten into the rhythm of, of running, I decided I was going to sign up for a race here locally. Now this was a couple of years ago. And there was a race on, on Blue Mountain called Metcon. And it was deemed a five kilometer adventure race. And it, the whole idea was it started at the base at the village of Blue Mountain. And when the horn blew, all the people that, that were running would start running up the mountain from the village. And about halfway up the mountain, you would run down again. And then you would run across the mountain. And then all through this five kilometers, I think it actually turned out to be six and a half kilometers, but no one wants to really run a six kilometer race. A five kilometers is more the trending thing these days. There would be 30 obstacles that, um, that you'd be met with. Now, I think I, have a, I think I have a picture of me on these, one of these obstacles. Is it gonna show? There it is, there's me. Now I have in here to wait for Rora's applause, so. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is one of the obstacles and there's a big pool underneath and this is really close to the end of the race and, and you're, you're covered in sweat, you're covered in mud and then they want you to use these, this obstacle and jump on these monkey bars and then try and get your way across the monkey bars. Usually you would grab the monkey bars and your hands would be so covered in mud that you'd grab the first rung and then you would flip off backwards into the pool, which is what I did the first time. And the second time that I did Metcon, they did it the year after, this was me, I think, being successful. I was able to do it. And it's, it's difficult. I don't know if you remember monkey bars when you were a kid. It's not easy when you're an adult. Uh, and so I, I remember doing that. And um, doing Metcon was really enjoyable. Now, this was, uh, this was probably eight years ago, this picture is. Um, and I've, I've gotten a little bit more in shape than, the, than that. But after some years of running, I began to really enjoy it. And Metcon, this was kind of the beginning of my journey of enjoying running. And these days I can run a six kilometer loop for leisure and can do it in about 40 minutes. And as I was beginning to kind of study and read, I began to realize that in our Western culture, running is a verb that we, that we often live by. We're always running. We're running late, we run errands, we, we're running on empty, we run for exercise. You know, we, we say, I have to run to the store quickly. We're always running. And as I began to study, I realized that um, this book that I was reading about the culture of the Middle East is that people just don't run as much as we do here. They just don't run. Andrew Thompson, an Anglican priest, in the United Arab Emirates says this, it's extremely rare to see an Arab anywhere running in the Gulf in public, not in shopping malls, not in the street, anywhere. And I began to find it fascinating that as a Westerner like Andrew Thompson, he began to describe the stark differences that he would see from his home in England 
and what he notices as he does ministry in the Middle East. He said, running in public is just not something you often see. And it's for one reason only, he says. It's very difficult, and there's another picture I think, there's a, uh, it's very difficult to run with, I might not be saying this right, an abaya or a dishdasha. And it's men and women, and, and they wear robes in the Middle East. And men, women in the, men and women in the Middle East, they wear these because they're modestly covered from head to toe. And the reason you don't see them running is simply because the robe restricts their stride while they run. And if one were to run, the only way to run is to hitch up your robe or your dress and allow your stride to improve. And he says this is largely unthinkable in the Middle East because Middle Eastern culture regards showing too much flesh as immodest and shameful. It would be undignified to do so. And he says, it's been like this in the Middle East for a very long time. The more status you have in the Middle East, the less likely you are to run. Especially if you're a patriarchal figure, a tribal elder, or a landowner. However, in one of Jesus' most well-known parables, the prodigal son, Jesus breaks cultural norms to give his audience something to think about. In the prodigal son, the master storyteller of Jesus tells the story of a young man who violated almost every code of good behavior and demanded his father's inheritance before the father had even died. Kenneth Bailey, an evangelical scholar in the Middle East, decided that he wanted to get some modern-day reactions of the prodigal son from different Arabs. So he set out to tell the story, and the reactions were all the same. That would never happen in my village, one would say. And he would say, why is that? It's an impossible request to ask for an inf a father's inheritance. Then Kenneth would say, why, what would happen in your village if a son asked this of his son? The father would beat him, of course, would be the reply. And then Kenneth would say, why is that? The request means he wants his father dead. In the Middle East, at a certain age, it is the duty of the son to care for parents. There's an obligation to care for elderly parents and then ensure that they are buried in a respectful way when they pass away. And so for a son to abandon this duty is one that brings ultimate shame on him. And what's interesting is at the beginning of Jesus' parable, we see that the father is very peaceful and grateful in his response. Quite the opposite from what Kenneth Bailey discovered in his survey. We see that in Jesus' story, after the request is made, the father, in Luke 15, 12, divided the property between his two sons. The son's earthly father does not do what a typical father would or should do. Many people surveyed said this would bring such a beating but not this father in Jesus' story. This father is different. And the story goes on to say that the son squanders all the inheritance given to him. And he soon realizes that even the servants in his own home have a better life than he does. And so he returns to seek forgiveness. Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And the father does something unthinkable. He runs. The old man, this is not in scripture, this is assumed. The old man likely hitches up his robe, exposing skin, exposing his legs in the most undignified and shameful way, and he runs to his son. Likely through his village for everyone to see. An old man, a patriarch, running. It likely would have been a shock for everyone to see because they wouldn't have known what he was running for. Only the father saw his son. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him. The father didn't care what others thought of him. All he could think about was his son returning home. The same son who wished him dead 
in order to have money. The same son who walked out on him is coming home. And the father just can't wait for him to be home, and so he runs to him. And it's very interesting contrast between father and son. The son likely getting ready for the beating of a lifetime, full of fear and just hoping that his father would make him a hired servant. And the father running, not caring about the shame and dignity he was bringing upon himself, was just wanting to welcome his son home. And the story should have been one of anger and hatred and shame and loss of respect, but instead the father owned all of this because he ran. This story from Jesus would have stunned his audience because it's not what a typical father would do or should do. Normally, the father would be running to give the beating, but instead he ran to embrace. The father deliberately shamed himself out of love for his son. He made himself weak and undignified. The shame was cast aside in order to have a joyful reconciliation. And, you know, we typically take this, this message when we hear this, this story, this parable, that God will take us back no matter what. That's what I always took from this story. But the, I think there's, there's cultural significance here that, that I began to, to see and understand. And it might be slightly off. You may know more than I on this. But I think there's a cultural significance that we miss here in the West that is overlooked. And that, that's, that is the father ran and, and brought shame upon himself. And so when we put this story through the, the lens of a, of a Middle Eastern culture, we see the significance of the father running. It's about God taking on our shame. Our shame is not our shame anymore, but rather absorbed by the father who simply doesn't care what others think about him in the act of running. And so yes, the prodigal son is about God taking us back, but at a much greater cost to the father, the cost of shame. And so the parable of the prodigal son is more about the father than what we've let on in the West. Because it's about reconciliation, because of what the father does. And it's interesting because the context of the parable of the prodigal son is told in a series of parables, while Jesus is having a meal with the, with the religious Pharisees, who we know make their faith about themselves. And in the prodigal son, Jesus makes it about the father and the sacrifices the father makes, not the son. And when we look at the story today, we can take the, to heart that we are in that story. We are the sons and daughters in that story. The story is about God the Father willing to get us back at all costs. Lastly, I want you to think about one other thing. This is this question. Who else ran in the Bible? I'm going to tell you one story, and as you read, you might find something else. There is one notable instance in the Gospels, and it's right near the end. We are met with Jesus dying on the cross and, and being buried. And we come across Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. I'm going to read you just a, a, a small snippet of this. The day of rest was over. There, it won't be on the screen because it's not planned. The day of rest was over. The sun was coming up on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the grave. At once the earth shook and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. He came and pushed back the stone from the door and sat on it. His face was bright like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The soldiers were shaking with fear and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who is nailed to the cross. He is not here. He has risen from the dead as he said he would. Come and see the place where he lay. Run fast and tell his followers that he has risen from the dead. He is going before you to the country of Galilee. You will see him there as I have told you. They went away from the grave in a hurry. They were afraid, and yet they had much joy. They ran to tell their followers. They ran to tell the followers of Jesus what had happened. And when his followers heard this news, in Mark 16, 13, it says, they ran to tell the news. 
probably pulling up their robes, they went to see their tomb for themselves. The resurrection of Jesus made people run. They didn't think about what others thought. They didn't care about their dignity. They cared about Jesus. They put all those things aside to see if the resurrection was true. You know, I find it really fascinating that when we intertwine a, a cultural understanding of the things people do and did, we pull more meaning out of the story that we're so used to hearing. So as you read your Bible on your own, note when people run. And know that there's a cultural significance of this act is one that potentially brings a lot of shame on people when they do this. Note why they are running and who they might be running to or running from. It made people shrug off what others thought of them as they ran to tell others about the resurrection. And I find that just phenomenal. This week, remember that the resurrection of Jesus made people run. Let's pray. Father, what an incredible image that um, we just think about. You, you doing anything at all costs to reconcile with us, even if it means shaming yourself. What a shocking thing that could have been for people. What a shocking thing it is for us. But we thank you that you will do anything at a very high cost to reconcile with us. And so we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.